So welcome uh, and good afternoon and good evening to our guests, wherever you are around the world, Democrats Abroad members, and to all of you who joined this call from wherever you are in the world. My name is Martha McDevitt Pugh. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a California voter living in the Netherlands, and I'm also the international chair of Democrats Abroad. And I'm delighted that we have a very special guest that we'll hear from later today to kick off our 2024 election year. Uh, he's a friend of Democrats Abroad, a former member of D DA France, and a 2024 DA convention delegate, Congressman Jamie Raskin. Now, as Americans who advocate for issues that uniquely impact those of us around the world, it really means a lot to have a member of Congress who knows us well and who has played a role in the extraordinary work that we do to mobilize voters around the world, millions of Americans who live outside the United States. Um, and I wanna first of all acknowledge the organizers who made today's webinar possible. The idea and the invitation came from Angela Fobbs of Germany, who's also our communications director, and Dana Freeling of Finland. And they were participating along with many other Democrats abroad members in a congressional door knock last June, just prior to the start of our annual general meeting. Now, if you've never been to a DA congressional door knock, I can really highly recommend it. Um, in more than 100 meetings with congressional staff and several members of Congress, we shared about the issues that uniquely impact Americans living abroad, like taxation, citizenship for our family members, voting access, to access to Medicare and Social Security, all these issues that matter to us. And we asked members to sign on to H.R. 2729, um, a bill to establish a commission on Americans living abroad, which would form a commission to study us and the issues that impacts us so very much and really give us a basis for getting recognition uh, inside the United States and being very well understood uh, and part of legislation going forward. Um, and it was really very special to be there in Washington, D.C. on a congressional door, door knock together in person and to have that opportunity to share our stories about our lives abroad with our elected representatives and their staff. And it was at a meeting with Congressman Raskin that he agreed to speak to us um, today on January 6th. Um, I also want to thank the technical team, Breck McCarg, the chair of Democrats Abroad in the UK, and Beth Landry, who serves on the DA Maryland state team. Um, and it's the work of our volunteers that makes Democrats Abroad work possible. In 2020, we made miracles happen under difficult circumstances during a pandemic, and we increased the civilian vote abroad by 50%. Now think about that, 50% under difficult circumstances. The number of Americans voting from abroad exceeded President Biden's margin of victory in both Georgia and Arizona. And we are committed to having extraordinary results like that again this year. We're gearing up and there are many opportunities to do exciting and fulfilling work. Um, and I really hope that all of you will join us um, if you're not already in a volunteer role and see what you can do to help get out the vote in this really important year. So thank you all for being us today. Um, there's a couple of links we're gonna drop in the box um, about some upcoming events. Um, so thanks to the uh, team for doing that. And I'll now hand over to Angela to provide an overview of today's event. Go ahead, Angela. Thanks, Martha. Uh, January 6th is was a day in 2021 that changed everything for me. Um, it made me more dedicated to eliminating the fascist and authoritarian elements in our government. I, how did it make you guys feel? Because it, it was a terrible event. And since 2020, since 2015, Donald Trump and the Republicans have openly worked to reverse the 21st century and the 20th century. Uh, democracy is not just who we elect, it's each of us caring about the welfare of our nation, the world, our rights and our freedoms and acting to preserve it. So let's go back to that day for a moment and remember what happened. Um, it was, that was one heck of a day. We shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. We shall know the truth. Well, here is the God's truth about January 6, 2021. Close your eyes. Go back to that day. What do you see? <laughs> Rioters rampaging, waving for the first time inside this Capitol. 
Confederate flag that symbolized the cause to destroy America. What else do you see? A mob breaking windows, kicking in doors, breaching the Capitol. American flags on poles being used as weapons, as spears. Fire stingers being thrown at the heads of police officers. We saw with our own eyes, rioters menace these halls, threatening the life of the Speaker of the House, literally erecting gallows to hang the Vice President of the United States of America. Can I speak to Pelosi? Yeah, we're coming. Oh, my kids, we're coming for you too. They've got the gallows set upside this Capitol building. It's time to start using them. Start making a list, put all those names down, yeah. and we start hunting them down one by one. Yeah. We had a disbursement of tear gas in the rotunda. Please be advised your mask under your seats. Please grab a mask, place it in your lap, and be prepared to don your mask in the event that we get a breach. When the order came to evacuate, I stayed behind for a while until two Republicans came up to me. One of them said, you can't let them see you. I know these people. I can talk to these people. I can talk my way through these people. I remember every moment vividly. I viscerally feel the pounding on the gallery doors. It's too late for that. I hear the shot ringing out. I replay how I made plans to use my gas mask and my cane, newly at my side from a five-week-old knee replacement surgery, to fight back if attacked. And I remember not knowing if I would make it out of our seat of democracy alive or if our democracy itself would survive. <laughs> And so, like many of you, with many of you, including luckily a, a former linebacker standing next to me, uh, we had to contemplate actually defending the floor of the House of Representatives. And at that point, I thought about what it meant. Was I willing to die for my country? Was I willing to die to make sure democracy continues? And at that time, around this time last year, I said yes. Yes, I would. What the extremists who roamed these halls targeted was not only the lives of elected leaders, what they sought to degrade and destroy was not only a building, hallowed as it is. What they were assaulting were the institutions, the values, the ideals that generations of Americans have marched, picketed, and shed blood to establish and defend. Here are the most incriminating moments from all of the January 6th hearings. Day one, Trump's wide-ranging efforts to overturn a valid election led to the January 6th insurrection. January 6th was the culmination of an attempted coup. I was slipping in people's blood. It was carnage. It was chaos. We're going to walk down to the Capitol 
because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Day two, Donald Trump denies the truth about the election results. There are suggestions by, I believe it was Mayor Giuliani to go and declare victory. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Day three, Trump pressures Pence not to certify the valid election. When Mike Pence made it clear that he wouldn't give in to Donald Trump's scheme, Donald Trump turned the mob on him. Bring out Pence! Bring it out! Mike Pence has betrayed this president, and he has betrayed the people of the United States, and we will never, ever forget! Day four, Trump pressures state election officials and workers to break the law. Do you know how it feels to have the president of the United States to target you? There is nowhere I feel safe. Nowhere. Mr. President, stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. A, a lot of threats, wishing death upon me. This turned my life upside down. Day five. Trump pressures the Department of Justice to overturn the election. Mr. Rosen, the president asked you to seize voting machines from state governments. What was your response to that request? We had seen nothing improper with regard to the voting machines. He responded very quickly and said, yeah, what I'm just asking you to do is just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. Day six. Trump knew the mob was armed and dangerous. I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Let my people in, take the effing mags away. As an American, I was disgusted. It was unpatriotic. It was un-American. We were watching the Capitol building get defaced over a lie. Day seven, Trump sends a rallying cry to far-right extremist groups to march on Washington. Donald Trump summoned a mob to Washington, D.C., and ultimately spurred that mob to wage a violent attack on our democracy. Now Donald Trump is calling on his supporters to descend on Washington, D.C. Millions of Americans moving to Washington, occupying the entire area, if, if necessary, storming right into the Capitol. You better understand something, son. You better understand something. Red wave, bitch. Red wave, this is gonna be a red wedding. There's a fucking million of us out there. And we are listening to Trump, you're the boss. If a president that's willing to try to encourage, to whip up a civil war amongst his followers using lies and deceit and snake oil, and regardless of the, the human impact, what else is he gonna do? Day eight. Trump relished the attack on the Capitol, waiting over three long hours to call off his mob. Within 15 minutes of leaving the stage, President Trump knew that the Capitol was besieged and under attack. We have a breach of the Capitol! Breach of the Capitol! He put a target on his own vice president's back and placed all the blame on him for not stopping the certification. More than three hours after he stopped speaking to a mob that he had sent armed to the Capitol. That's when he tweeted a video telling the rioters to go home. President Trump did not fail to act. He chose not to act. He refused to defend our nation and our Constitution. Tonight, I say this to my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone but your dishonor will remain. Trump and his MAGA allies lost a valid election and resorted to violence. They did it once, they can do it again, and they must be held accountable. And if you put me back in the White House, their reign is over. In 2016, I declared, I am your voice. Today, I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. Not gonna let me... I will totally obliterate 
the deep state. I will fire the unelected bureaucrats and shadow forces who have weaponized our justice system like it has never been weaponized before. It's sick. These are sick people. Do you feel highly confident that when you go back and in, in, is a, a senior member of this uh, uh, administration, President Trump's administration, starting in the afternoon of the 20th of January of 2025, uh, do you feel conf- confident that you will be able to deliver the goods, that we can have serious prosecutions and accountability? This is just not rhetoric. The deep state, the administrative state, the fourth branch of government never mentioned in the Constitution is going to be taken apart brick by brick. And the people that did these evil deeds will be held accountable and prosecuted, criminal prosecutions. Uh, Cash, I I know you're probably going to be head of the CIA, but do you believe that you can deliver the goods on this in a pretty short in a pretty short order of the first couple of months so we can get rolling on prosecutions? Yes, we got the bench for it, Bannon, and you know those guys. I'm not going to go out there and say their names right now so the radical left-wing media can terrorize them. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the one thing we learned in the Trump administration the first go-around is we got to put in all America patriots top to bottom. And we got them for law enforcement. We got them for intel collection. We got them for uh, offensive operations. We got them for DOD, CIA, everywhere. We will go out and find the conspirators, not just in government, but in the media, yes, We're going to come after the people in the media who lied about American citizens, who helped Joe Biden rig presidential elections. We're going to come after you, whether it's criminally or civilly. We'll figure that out. But, yeah, we're putting you all on notice. And, Steve, this is why they hate us. This is why we're tyrannical. This is why we're dictators. I want to be very, very clear on this. To be clear, do you in any way have any plans whatsoever, if reelected president, to abuse power, to break the law? to use the government to go after people? You mean like they're using right now? Under no circumstances, you are promising America tonight, you would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Except what? He's going crazy. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill, drill, drill. That's not, no, no. That's not retribution. I got I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, he keeps, we love this guy. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. Wow. Hello, everybody. I am Dana Freeling, uh, a Finnish resident and a Texas voter. The January 6th insurrection was the gravest assault on the American democracy since the Civil War, disrupting the peaceful transfer of power and nearly subverting democracy itself. The big lie that Biden did not legitimately win the 2020 election retains the support of most Republicans. GOP-led states around the country have been introduced Reducing and adopting bills that would both give Republican legislatures the ability to sabotage legitimate electoral outcomes and or others that would make it more difficult for Democrats to vote. These new threats and questions about the strength of the electoral system have rarely been more grave. Trump's victory next fall would portend the end of America's 250-year democracy, and the instigation of a new illiberal autocracy. We are told every cycle that this is the most important election of our lifetimes. But in fact, 2024 will help preserve or dismantle the very democracy we hold dear. What will your role be? And what can you do to help us be victorious in November? Angela? With just over 300 days until the 2024 presidential election, there's so much at stake this year. Uh, Starting with our president, we have 33 Senate seats. Most of those are Democrats that we need to hang on to. All 435 U.S. House of Representatives seats, 85 state legislators, 11 governorships are all up for election in 2024. Republicans have been telling us what they want to do for years. Please, please take them seriously. We have to do everything we can to get out the boat. We have a list of things you can do to help, tiny actions that you can do to make a big difference. 
The first thing on the list is to request an absentee ballot and vote. That is number one, vote all the way down the ballot. Uh, every vote in every state counts. And if we don't succeed, the lives of our children, our lives, everyone, it will be changed forever. All the issues that you care about are on the ballot this year. Wherever you are, you can make a difference. No one is coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. So I hope you will help us defend democracy. And now uh, we're gonna turn it over to uh, Martha. We have, we're expecting Congressman, ah, Congressman Maskin is here. So mm -hmm. here we go. We will. Thank you so much, Angela. And a huge welcome to Congressman Raskin. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Martha McDevitt Pugh. I'm the International Chair of Democrats Abroad. Really delighted to have you here with us today. Um, so let me introduce the Congressman, a longtime friend of Democrats Abroad. Representative Raskin is, was also a member of Democrats Abroad during his sabbatical in France and served as a Democrats Abroad delegate to the Democratic National Convention. Congressman Jamie Raskin is the U.S. Representative for Maryland's 8th Congressional District, and he serves as the ranking member on the House Committee on Oversight and Accountability. He served as the lead House manager in the second Senate impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump, which ended with a 57 to 43 vote to convict the president for inciting a violent insurrection against the government to overthrow the 2020 presidential election. Raskin also served on the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol and served three terms on the House Judiciary, Oversight, and Administration Committees. He served two terms on the Rules Committee. And prior to Congress, Raskin was a three-term state senator in Maryland and a professor of constitutional law for more than a quarter century at American University Washington College of Law. He is a magnum cum laude graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, where he served as the editor of the Harvard Law Review. He has offered several books, including We the Students, The Washington Post bestseller Overruling Democracy, The Supreme Court versus the American People, and The New York Times number one bestseller Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy from 2022. Um, so welcome, Congressman Raskin, and I will hand it over to you. Good morning, Martha. Good morning to all my friends and Democrats abroad all over the world. What a pleasure and honor it is to be with you guys. Um, I tell everybody that the best Democratic state party in America is actually Democrats abroad. Um, and uh, I, I know that because I've uh, lived in several states in addition to my native uh, Maryland. Um, and uh, I lived abroad and I know how much political muscle and how much political vision there is in Democrats abroad. And um, I'm delighted to be with you because I think your role in the upcoming election is going to be essential to uh, mobilize and galvanize the Democrats abroad, to get them all registered to vote, to get everybody engaged voting at the federal level, the state level, the local level, the county level, but also using your voices to reinforce to people here in the country, the uh, the central and historic importance of this election, um, as um, we just heard already from several people in the video and also from um, some Democrats abroad people. So look, uh, it is a, um, it's a melancholy, bittersweet holiday. I'm looking forward to the day when we can commemorate January 6th and just remember the heroes um, Sergeant Cannell and Officer Dunn and Michael Fanone and Danny Hodges and Nancy Pelosi and Liz Cheney and uh, the Hakeem Jeffries and the people who insisted that we go back in and we vote, that we complete the process, that we not back down the 150 officers who were wounded, bloodied, hospitalized. Uh, by the fascists, uh, hundreds more officers who held the line and uh, fought off the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Ku Klux Klan, the Three Percenters, the domestic violent extremist groups, the Christian white nationalist groups, the religious cultists who were assembled, the people who defended American liberal democracy that day. But unfortunately, 
um, we haven't yet evolved uh, enough of a culture of uh, commemorating January 6th that we can focus on that. And the truth is, we're still in the middle of this fight, as Joe Biden said yesterday uh, in his speech at Valley Forge. Um, January 6th is today, literally, but it's also today, metaphorically, because uh, Donald Trump is running around the country saying he's going to pardon more than 900 uh, insurrectionists who were convicted of seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow or put down the government in the United States, uh, people who assaulted federal officers and were uh, prosecuted and jailed for it, people who destroyed federal property, people who conspired and did interfere with a federal proceeding. Um, Trump is saying he's going to go out and pardon them just like he pardoned Michael Flynn, just like he pardoned Dinesh D'Souza, just like he pardoned Roger Stone, just like he pardoned Steve Bannon. The inner core of his 2024 campaign is pardon political criminals. And now he is promising to pardon uh, a class of political shock troops who've already demonstrated their propensity and their willingness to engage in violence for Donald Trump and for whatever he says. Look, the political scientists tell us that the central characteristics of an authoritarian or fascist political party are these. One, a charismatic leader whose political will is elevated over the rule of law, the Constitution, the will of the people. It is the will of the dictator that means everything. Two, um, a refusal to accept the results of democratic elections that don't go their way. And three, a refusal to renounce or an eagerness to embrace political violence as an instrument for obtaining and maintaining political power. So Joe Biden got in trouble a couple of years ago when he talked about the Republican Party as a semi-fascist political party. Hey, if the shoe semi-fits, you semi-wear it, okay? Because uh, you know, I take no glee in saying that. I've got the bust of one president on my desk in the Rayburn House office building, and it's Abraham Lincoln. And I inherited it from my grandfather, who was in uh, politics, and he loved Lincoln, and I love Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln created the Republican Party as a third political party, a new political party to replace the Whigs, it was pro-freedom. It was anti-slavery. It was pro-union. It was pro-immigration. It was anti-know-nothing. Uh, it was pro-science. It was a pro-reason party. And they've taken Abraham Lincoln's beautiful party and they have reduced it to a cult of authoritarian personality that does whatever Donald Trump tells them to do. That's the reality of where we are in 2024. And that's the reality of the election that we're in. But it's important also for people to understand that it, another critical ingredient to political fascism is corruption. And we released a report this week. I hope you checked it out. I've basically been working on it, at least in my head for the last seven years. But we've been working to collect the information for seven years, as Donald Trump and the Republicans have done everything in their power to suppress and conceal and obstruct the investigation. It was begun by my beloved late colleague, Elijah Cummings, uh, who then occupied the position I've got as the ranking Democrat on the House Oversight Committee. But we released a report called White House for Sale, um, how uh, princes, prime ministers, and premiers paid off President uh, Trump. We were able to document $7.8 million in unconstitutional, unlawful foreign government emoluments that were collected by Donald Trump as president. This amount might seem small to you, and it is small because it just scratches the surface of the money that was coming in. We only had access to four businesses, uh, Trump Tower, Fifth Avenue, Trump Tower, UN Plaza, Trump International Hotel, Vegas, and Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C., which I call the Washington Emolument, uh, because that was where all of the bribes were dropped off by the diplomats and the foreign government lobbyists that were uh, coming to have their way with the American people by paying off Donald Trump. Um, we, that's four businesses out of more than 500 businesses. We were only able to get from Mazar's two years worth of accounting information before uh, Chairman Comer of the Oversight Committee shut down 
uh, the discovery process, telling Mazars that they didn't have to comply any further. Um, and we only got information from 20 countries of 195 countries on Earth. But even with that limited window, we are able to glimpse the vast field of corruption and lawlessness that Trump brought to the White House. He said his campaign was going to be the greatest infomercial of all time. And he converted, when he got elected in 2016, the White House into an instrument for his private self-enrichment and money-making. He refused to divest himself of any of his businesses. He said he was just going to put day-to-day -day management in the hands of his sons, but he would continue, obviously, to own the businesses, to profit from them and keep his hand in it. And we know that he was directly involved um, in all of these schemes to rake in money from China, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Indonesia, India, you just go right down the line. So check out our report um, about uh, Donald Trump's, um, what, what is really motivating him and why he is desperate to the point of violence of staying in office. This is a business model for an otherwise failed, multiply bankrupt uh, businessman. And uh, he wants to keep the grift going, just like Vladimir Putin in Russia, just like Orban in Hungary, just like Marcos in the Philippines, El Sisi in Egypt, Bolsonaro in Brazil. This is the class of uh, dictators and autocrats uh, we're up against. So uh, I had a chance to talk to President Biden for 15 minutes yesterday morning uh, before his speech. I was thrilled about the speech. I hope that you guys are too. He framed the issue exactly the way we need to understand it. Um, because the issues confronting us are profound. Uh, the Democrats have been doing a fantastic job on the economy. You know, I sat there for four years uh, under Trump. We had infrastructure week. We had infrastructure month. We had infrastructure press conference. We just never had an infrastructure bill. But Joe Biden got it, and we had it in the second week. We passed it in the second month of his administration, a $1.2 trill, trillion dollar investment trillion dollar investment in the roads, the highways, the bridges, the ports, the airports, broadband in the rural areas, rapid uh, internet for everybody, and so on. Um, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Inflation is now the lowest anywhere in the Western world uh, here in the U.S., dramatically lowered prescription drug prices. I had constituents who were paying more than $1,000 a month for their insulin shots as diabetics. Now it's limited to $35 a month because the Democrats did that. And we didn't get a single Republican vote along the way. The Chips and Science Act, um, the, the, uh, the Climate Action Provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act, the greatest investment in climate action in world history. So the Democrats have done all that. We've got a not just a defensive political democracy theme but making democracy work for the people reality that we're able to campaign on all over the country and with your guys' help all over the world. Um, and so it is the Democrats versus the autocrats in Moscow, the kleptocrats in Mar-a-Lago, the theocrats like Michael Johnson, the plutocrats who actually run the Republican Party and control the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas and um, uh, Sam Alito and uh, Mrs. Waterford, whatever her name is. Um, these people have been put in by corporate plutocrats. Um, and so who is going to beat the autocrats and who's going to beat the kleptocrats and who's going to beat the plutocrats? Then who's going to beat the theocrats? The Democrats are. That's us. I'm not saying our party is perfect, but compared to them, we are because we're a party of democracy and we're a party of freedom. I mean, Lincoln said it himself. Somebody said to him, well, what's the relationship between the Constitution and the Declaration? He said, well, the Constitution is about democracy. It's like the beautiful silver frame upon which rests the golden apple of freedom that was promised in the Declaration of Independence. In other words, we need democracy in order to protect our freedom. And democracy and freedom are both under assault by the right wing autocrats and theocrats of America. And who's going to protect women's right to choose in an America that is now half unfree for women and half free, the Democrats are going to do it. We're the ones fighting for the right to choose and the right to travel, the right for women to decide their own destiny. Um, so 
I know I'm preaching the choir here. Somebody said, what are you doing this morning? I said, I'm talking to Democrats abroad. They said, you're preaching the choir. And I said, you know what? I like preaching to the choir, okay? I, the choir needs to be preached to, too. Um, but I do want to say that the, the theme of this campaign, which is the reality of the world today, which is we can make democracy go forward because democracy is not just uh, a static set of institutional frameworks and laws. It is that, and we're going to defend that. But democracy is a project in motion always. And we've got, you know, millions of disenfranchised people in America. We got 713,000 people down the road from me in Washington, D.C., taxpaying, draftable American citizens who are the only citizens of a national capital on earth disenfranchised in their own legislature. Imagine if you told the people of Paris they couldn't be represented in l'Assemblée Nationale because they breathe the same air as representatives who come from other parts of France. You would have another French Revolution on your hands. And, you know, when the Democrats uh, were in in the last Congress, I was thrilled that I got to work with Eleanor Holmes Norton. I was the floor leader for D.C. statehood. We passed D.C. statehood um, in the House. And I started by thanking the people of Washington, D.C., who are right in Washington, right next to the Capitol, who have a real, valid, authentic political grievance, unlike the programmed robots of Donald Trump, who had a phony counterfeit grievance and came in and beat the daylights out of our officers and nearly overthrew the government of the United States and toppled our constitutional order. And the people of Washington have never committed violence, but they've done it the right way, working through the constitutional process, asking for statehood. And we must grant them their statehood and we must grant statehood to three and a half million American citizens living in Puerto Rico who are disenfranchised. And Democracy needs to be moving forward across the board. It is time for ranked choice voting in our elections in 2024. It's time for us to elect the president of the United States the way we elect governors, mayors, representatives, senators, everybody else. Whoever gets the most votes wins. How about that? The Electoral College has given us five popular vote losers in our history, twice in this century alone, 2000 and 2016. Donald Trump and George W. Bush. Um, it's not just undemocratic, though. It doesn't just marginalize the vast majority of Americans who don't live in swing states because everybody knows it's only the swing states that count. And most people live in safe red states or safe blue states in Texas or California or New York or so on. So it's not just irrational. It's not just arbitrary. It's not just undemocratic. It's dangerous. We saw that on January 6, 2021. There are so many nooks and crannies um, in the obsolete, antiquated uh, electoral college process that you've got a strategic bad faith actor like Donald Trump, and he can exploit each of these nooks and crannies to try to revisit the election and throw it open again. So we not only have to defend the democratic framework, we've got to keep democracy growing. Tocqueville said that an American democracy is either shrinking and shriveling away or it's growing and it's expanding. And we've got to get back on the growth track for democracy in America. And then that means defending democracy and human rights all over the world. The autocrats aren't going to do it and the kleptocrats aren't going to do it and the theocrats aren't going to do it and the plutocrats. But the Democrats are going to do it. That's us. So I don't mean to too, put too much pressure on you guys, but we need you fighting wherever you are all over the world and explaining the fundamental importance of us getting this election right. I'm going to leave you with the words of two of my great favorite Democratic patriots who fought for progress in America. And one was uh, Frederick Douglass, who was born about 45 minutes away from where I sit at the Y River Plantation into slavery, who escaped from slavery to become our great freedom fighter an abolitionist before the Civil War and through the Civil War and into the Reconstruction. And Douglas said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And the struggle may be moral, it may be physical, it may be moral and physical, but there must be struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And then I'm going to quote for you, finally, uh, Tom Paine, who got over here in 1774, two years before the Revolution. And he wrote the pamphlet that became the explosive trigger for the American Revolution. Common sense, 
by which he meant the sense you have without having to go to the Princeton Divinity School, uh, common sense that's available to everybody, but also the sense we have in common when we're willing to reason together and talk together and listen to each other. And he wrote this beautiful pamphlet in 1776 called The Crisis. Um, and it was a tough year. And as uh, Biden was saying yesterday at Valley Forge, we didn't know which way things were going to go. Half of the people are saying, you can't beat the theocrats. How can you separate church and state? Every government has to have an official church. And how can you beat the kings and the queens and the nobles? They've got all the power. They've got all the money. Right. They've got all the authority. They've got history. And you know, everybody on our side's walking around saying, oh, what's the message? And we're not messaging right and all that stuff. You know, so he wanted to write a message so that people would get it loud and clear. And so he did. And in this crisis, I'm going to just quote this little passage for you. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi makes me um, update it so it doesn't offend modern sensibilities and says uh, Payne was a feminist and he wouldn't mind. And he, he wouldn't mind, I don't think. So anyway, he said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country. But everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. So let's make that victory ours in 2024 Democrats abroad, and thank you for everything you guys do. I'm sending you my my love and my gratitude. All right, thank you, uh, Congressman Raskin. We have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the Q and A box has been loading up, but our first question is from Dana Freeling. Uh, Dana, do you want to ask your question? Uh, so great to see you again and to have you here. Thank you. During the insurrection at the Capitol. Signage included swastikas and T-shirts reading Camp Auschwitz. And early in Trump's presidency in 2017 in Charlottesville, Jews will not replace us, was the mantra of the mob. While anti-Semitism has long been the canary in the coal mine for the rise of autocracy worldwide, we track an exponential surge in anti-Jewish incidents in recent years and in the wake of the Mideast conflict. You recently co-signed a letter to appropriators, Representative Raskin, to implement the first ever national um, strategy to counter anti-Semitism, requesting funds to combat the swell of hate crimes, discrimination, and threats against the American Jewish community. Can you speak to the link between the surge in anti-Semitism and our struggle to preserve democracy? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Dana. I mean, um, you know, in this dark period where um, the right wing in America and all over the world have unleashed these primitive impulses from the last century and prior centuries, racism and anti-Semitism and uh, religious discrimination and uh, authoritarianism, um, it is... Um, you know, it's no surprise that we're we're dealing with, um, you know, this appalling resurgence of open anti-Semitic feeling I and mean, something that most of us in America never experienced in our lifetimes to see this going on. And of course, um, it began before Donald Trump took office. They ran TV ads. If you go back and look at the final television ad run by Donald Trump for president. It had um, shadowy, scary pictures put up of Janet Yellen, Lloyd Blankfein, and George Soros. And it said, these globalists do not have your interests at heart. They are trying to make money for themselves, and they are um, opposed to the interests of the American majority. So they were pandering to uh, anti-Semitism during the campaign in 2016. And then, of course, everybody remembers um, the the fruit of Steve Bannon's strategy uh, detailed well in a remarkable book you should check out 
by a young man named Christopher Wiley called Mind Blank, Mind F, I don't want to say it aloud. But anyway, he um, he worked for Cambridge Analytica and it was all about how they wanted to use Facebook and the social media to identify anti-Semites and racists um, and malcontents and misanthropes in the society. They were looking for people uh, through these Facebook psychological ads uh, who mirror Donald Trump's psychological profile of uh, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Those were literally the traits they were looking for. And they found like two or three percent of the public. And they said, we're going to activate these people and politicize these people and get them out there. And so we have been dealing with the results of that. And it's scary and it's dangerous. Um, you saw recently uh, my colleague, Elise Stefanik, um, on her high horse crusade against the presidents of the Ivy League schools uh, with her yes, no questions designed to uh, box them in as part of this campaign against higher education and against uh, DEI, which you know they consider uh, the big villain. But in any event, uh, I, I sent uh, Stefanik uh, a series of my own yes, no questions right after her yes, no questions. I said, you know, great job demonstrating the lack of common sense of these college presidents. For me, those were easy questions. I, I spent 25 years in higher education as a dean and a law professor. Uh, if somebody's calling for the genocide of the Jews or the Palestinians or anyone else, you immediately dispatch campus police to get over there to make sure the person's not armed. Because in this age of lax Republican gun laws, we've got 40 million AR-15s loosen the society. And if somebody's talking about genocide against the Jews, you want to get the police over there immediately to make sure the person's not armed. And if they're not armed in an immediate danger to people around them, then get them a mental health evaluation as quickly as you can. And if they're not deranged, but they're just like the UVA graduates who helped to organize um, the anti-Semitic riot in Charlottesville, or they're like Stuart Rhodes, the Yale Law School graduate who uh, was head of the Proud Boys, uh, then you figure out indeed what the college presidents were talking about. Does it create a hostile learning environment? But of course, they showed no common sense and just went off on the legalistic tangent to begin with falling right into her trap. But I gave her a trap of my own. I said, Ms. Stefanik, you don't want anti-Semites as, uh, or people tolerant of anti-Semitism as president of MIT, even this Jewish president of MIT, um, how do you feel about uh, anti about people who want to be president who have Holocaust revisionist neo-Nazi anti-Semites over to their house for dinner in Mar-a-Lago? Nicholas Fuentes last Friday called for the absolute annihilation of the Jews when we come back to power. He said the perfidious Jews, we're going to have absolute annihilation. Can she denounce Donald Trump having that guy over for dinner with Kanye West, another avowed anti-Semite. How about that? How about somebody becoming president who sees very fine people on both sides of an anti-Semitic riot in Charlottesville? How about people who um, talk about the great replacement theory, which was invoked by the mass murderers at the Tree of Life synagogue and at the Buffalo supermarket? Well, she's one of the people who's embraced the great replacement theory and has campaigned on it. You can read a whole New York Times article about it. Are you willing to renounce and denounce all of these things and say that somebody's not qualified to be president if he embraces anti-Semitism in that way and puts out anti-Semitic TV ads? And you know what her answer was? I was surprised that she even answered me. But she, she said, thank you very much. Donald Trump has been the best president that that the Jewish population's ever had in America. Why, she said, he supported moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He cemented our hold over the Golan Heights. He pulled us out of the Iran nuclear agreement. And it was all these things about Israel, because, you know, American Jews are basically just Israelis in disguise, according to Donald Trump. And uh, Elise Stefanik follows that. In other words, American Jews could not have their own concerns about violent anti-Semites the kind of people who show up at the Tree of Life uh, synagogue and just mow everybody down in the worst anti-Semitic attack in American history. So, um, you know, I've had it um, with their 
phony, fraudulent campaign against higher education where they pretend to be opposing anti-Semitism and anti-Semites. If you're really opposed to anti-Semitism, you will oppose it wherever you see it. Uh, you will not protect it when it takes place within your political party. Thank you. All right, we have a, a we actually have a lot of questions in the Q&A, but um, I'm just gonna sort through a few of them. Um, here's a good one. Uh, couldn't SCOTUS decide to leave the determination of whether Trump engaged in insurrection and is ineligible to hold office and, and appear on the ballot up to state officials and judges? I think that's an unlikely outcome um, because that's very messy, of course, if you know somebody is constitutionally disqualified to be on the ballot in this state or that state. I mean, what would happen, of course, is that um, in the bluer states, people would correctly enforce the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I mean, it's not uh, a hard problem. It's unambiguous, clear language. It says, um, if you've sworn an oath to support the Constitution of the United States and you violated that oath by engaging in insurrection or rebellion, you should never be allowed to hold federal or state office again. Um, and the legislative history is perfectly clear. When it started off, the radical Republicans who added this to the uh, Constitution started off with a far more sweeping proposition. In the House, it was voted that anybody who participated in the Confederacy in insurrection or rebellion at all would be disenfranchised for life. And when it got over to the Senate, they said, wow, that's way too uh, broad. We've got to zero in on the most culpable, guilty class of offenders. It's people who actually were public officials who... Uh, who betrayed their oath of office by engaging in insurrection or rebellion. And even with those people, we won't disenfranchise them. People like Jefferson Davis or John Breckinridge or Donald Trump, they can still vote. It's just they can't serve in office again because they can't be trusted with state power. So it's perfectly clear. Um, but I think that it's unlikely that the court would say, well, we'll let each state decide for itself. I think if they do the right thing, they'll say he is disqualified. Um, you know that uh, more than 100 million Americans are disqualified for running for president, right? Um, 75 million people are disqualified because they don't meet the age requirement. They're under 35. My wonderful colleague I serve with on the Oversight Committee, Maxwell Frost, um, he's under 35. He can't run. AOC can't run. She's not 35. They're disqualified um, because of what you might argue is a far more morally arbitrary requirement, which is that you hit age 35. There's also 25 or 26 million people who are disqualified to run for president because they weren't born in America, because we have a native born uh, citizen requirement. Arnold Schwarzenegger can't run for president. Jennifer Granholm can't run for president. Donald Trump uh, inhabits a group of maybe a dozen, maybe a dozen, it might be closer to a half dozen Americans who essentially have disqualified themselves by engaging in insurrection. And rebellion. It's a tiny group of people um, and far more, I think, morally and politically defensible um, uh, because you put yourself into that category by trying to overthrow democracy. And they say it's undemocratic. It's undemocratic to say that somebody tries to overthrow the result of a presidential election that they can't get back into public office. I mean, give me a break. Abraham Lincoln, again, said it best. He said, insurrection, said at the beginning of the Civil War, he said, insurrection is an offense against the organizing principle of democratic government, which is that people get to choose their own elected officials. So I think that we're likely either if they do the right thing, they'll say he's disqualified. If they do the wrong thing, they're far more likely to say it's really up to Congress to decide and Congress has to act knowing that the Republicans who control the House of Representatives right now, by the way, by only two votes, um, would never do anything to uh, actually enforce the meaning of the 14th Amendment. Uh, can you do you have time to take one more question? Sure. OK, uh, this question is from Marion. There are still many persons in Congress who were involved in some way with the events that transpired leading up to and including January 6th. Do you have any hope that they will ever be prosecuted? I'm sorry, wait, wait who, the, who was the, involved? The uh, people in Congress that oh, were the involved. Members. Yes. 
Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, some of them are part of that tiny group of less than a dozen people I'm talking about. I mean, you know, in a just world, um, Jim Jordan would have complied with his subpoena, which, of course, he didn't. Now he's trying to get Hunter Biden to uh, comply with his subpoena, which, of course, he has because uh, Chairman Comer was all over the news saying, come before our committee and answer our questions. And Hunter Biden said, fine, I will. You know, he said he's come clean about uh, some terrible things that he did under drug addiction. It had nothing to do with his father, but he said, I'm happy to come before the committee, but he's not willing to go in a back room for 12 hours or 20 hours with the Republican lawyers so they can take snippets of the testimony and distort it for the world, which is, of course, what the Republicans have been doing and then not turning over uh, the transcripts of what had taken place. But anyway, Jim Jordan never even complied in any way. He never answered his subpoena when we subpoenaed him to come and talk uh, about what he knew. And he was clearly integrally involved in what took place. And there were some other ones, too. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's going to it's going to be tough. But, you know, I believe things will be known in history. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, do you have time for another one? Yes. Uh, if oh, uh, yes, this is my last one. Your last one. OK. Yes. Uh, if Trump wins the national election, what do we do to resist lawfully? Well, look, we've got some experience with this in the last administration. Uh, you know, I. I don't like to contemplate the hypothetical. I really don't think he can win. And um, I have uh, way too much faith in the American people. And I've got a lot of faith in the judicial system to be able to hear these cases. And I you know, keep believing that we are going to have a psychic breakthrough in American public consciousness. Um, but um, if it were to happen, um, we would uh, have to defend every institution that we've got. We'd have to defend the Democratic Party. We'd have to defend the courts. We'd have to defend the newspapers. We'd have to defend our local city councils. We would have to uh, defend the immigrants, as we did last time. We would have to go back under, and everybody's going to have to watch The Handmaid's Tale um, to see what it's like. And I know some of you live in societies uh, right now where you would have some other ideas about what you do to resist uh, the dictators and the oppressors. So anyway, thank you for having me, Democrats abroad. Um, I love what you guys are doing. Hang tough. All right. Hang tough for America. Hang tough for democracy and freedom on earth and stay close, everybody. All right. Thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Well, thank everyone for coming, uh, especially Congressman Raskin. Um, we definitely need your help uh, to get out the vote. Your first step is to vote. So please go to votefromabroad.org and request your absentee ballot and vote as far down the ballot as your state allows you. Um, we also need help. So if you have, if you would like to volunteer with us, that would be great. Everyone has something to offer. Doesn't matter uh, what you, anything, actually, we need so much help that all your help is welcome. So please uh, volunteer. And of course, we want to thank everyone who donated prior to this event, but uh, donations are always necessary and needed. And of course, we want to reshare our, our tiny actions uh, because there are a lot of things that you can do on your own and that you can do individually at home and that you don't have to give a lot of time for volunteering, but if you would like to volunteer, we sure would uh, like that. Uh, the, the video will be on YouTube probably in a couple of hours. So thank everyone so much. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Karen. And we'll see you the next time. Hope Hopefully you will join us on uh, International Voter Registration Weekend where we have a lot of great events going on. So. Thanks so much, Angela. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks. Everyone have a great day.